So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Paul Moon. I am the Senior Programs Manager at Grant Makers for Education. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all to the first of what we hope will be many programs in our new Rural Education Learning Series. Um, the goal of this learning series is to provide a platform for collaborative learning, um, sharing and action uh, in terms of rural education. Um, and so we're hoping that this will be a long-term series that uh, eventually leads into a couple of site visits. We actually had one planned for the summer, but uh, unfortunately uh, things got derailed. Um, so as we go through the program, please uh, use the chat at any time if you have any questions and we will do our best to monitor that. And with that said, I'd love to turn things over to Leslie Garola, who is the Director of Programs and Strategy at the Greater Texas Foundation. Leslie. Thank you, Paul. Um, like Paul said, my name is Leslie Garola. I work with Greater Texas Foundation. GTF is a statewide post-secondary focused foundation based in Bryan, Texas. Although we make grants to improve student outcomes in all parts of the state, we do have a specific goal around rural collaborations. Um, there are about 700,000 K-12 students in rural parts of Texas, and we believe it's important to have an intentional strategy to support rural students and rural institutions. We have been very pleased to work with Grant Makers for Education to help us all learn more about both the assets and challenges in rural regions. Um, as Paul mentioned, this webinar is the first in a series of opportunities to learn more about rural America and education and higher education in these areas, a bit of a rural orientation for all of us. We're very fortunate to have some stellar speakers for this first program. Their bios um, are in the program description online and links to their bios are also going to be placed in the chat box here. Um, I'll let you you read those um, because I want to save time for our discussion. Um, if you aren't next to a computer, know they are impressive. We have Anita Brown Graham, Professor of Public Law and Government and Director of the NC Impact Initiative at UNC Chapel Hill School of Government, Dr. Benga Ajalori, Senior Economist at the Center for American Progress, and Katherine Ferguson, Director of Rural and Regional Initiatives at the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group. I want to um, quickly recognize that Catherine was instrumental in pulling this group and webinar together. So thank you, Catherine. Um, if we go to slide three, this is an overview of our objectives and agenda for the session. Our speakers will focus on the questions on the right side of the slide. This is also in the program um, description. We do have some time reserved at the end for your questions, so please type those in the chat box as they come to mind, and we'll get to as many as we can. Let's dive in, and we'll start with Benga. What is rurality, and why is it so hard to define? Thank you, Leslie. So again, um, Senior Economist at the Center for American Progress, and we have been working on a lot of different rural issues over the past year. Uh, culminating in a huge report that we just released earlier this week on Monday, um, trying to develop what's the best way of improving rural development um, from a federal level. And so one of the things in our work that we found is that when we talk about rural America, we talk about it in a diff, you know, incorrectly because of some myths that's gonna be talked about later. And so what I wanna start with is by talking about how do we actually define it? So defining a rural place can be difficult because there are so many different definitions. Rural places are typically defined in relation to cities or urban places. Like we say rural is defined as not a metropolitan area. So that's comes from the Office of Managing Budget. We also say that rural is not an urban area and that's a census definition. And so with these, but the difficulty of that is what does that mean in terms of population? So for example, using the census definition, we find that nearly 60 million people are, do not live in an urban area, but 54% of rural places are uh, in a metro county. So we get these difficult kind of definitions and we get a lot of mix-ups. Now for me, I don't like the definition that these definitions because we're talking about rural in relation to something that is deemed more deserving or more important, like a city. And the problem is that that translates into policy. That also translates into philanthropy that we always, your rural areas always get left behind. 
And so this is why I'm kind of excited for this event and, that, and for this panel for people to talk about it. Uh, next slide. Other definitions of rural provide a greater breakdown beyond, you know, beyond a binary classification of like metro versus non-metro, rural versus urban. And so these are a lot of times based off of population or population density. So if you look at this map here, we have the spectrum that goes from a large metropolitan area down to what's called completely rural that is not adjacent to an MSA. And so you can see that this kind of diversity of rural areas and what's kind of important in this map is that every state has rural areas. And so that the issue of rural, of, of rural development touches every single state. And so, but even with this definition, it's still based off population. And one of the things that could happen is that if an area gets more population, they no, no longer become rural. So when we think about rural and in the rural space, kind of like the best definition is if you think you're rural, then you are rural. And that's the way that we kind of look at rural issues is like people who think they're rural, areas that think they're rural, then that counts as rural. And then we could focus on them and focus on them, not in relation to other places like urban areas or cities, but into like actually what they are. So one thing that's missing from these definitions is that of who lives in these rural places. And this is important because it fuels misconceptions about rural areas. And so the other panelists are gonna get into more detail on this, but I just want to highlight that rural areas are more diverse than what is commonly portrayed. So next slide. Thanks, Blinka. Hi, I'm, as noted, I'm Catherine Ferguson with the Aspen Community Strategies Group. Uh, I'm really interested. I'm so glad you're paying attention to this particular topic. And so part of what we're trying to do today is just level set and make sure that everybody has a strong uh, foundation uh, and it starts from the same place. So one thing that seems really important is to spend a little bit of time debunking some myths because a lot of the things that we often know about rural people and rural places, we get from media, uh, we get through talking with other people, but sometimes misconceptions, uh, or well, I would say not just sometimes, but misconceptions about rural people and rural places are quite pervasive. So here are a few things that I, I would just start with. Uh, uh, that might surprise you, though it looks like from the chat that there are actually a lot of you uh, who are part on this particular webinar who are also in rural regions. So some of this may be more familiar. So agriculture, we often think of as the backbone of the rural economy. And of course, agriculture remains really important. But we don't always remember is that the rural economy looks increasingly like the, like the urban economy with a growing service sector, public sector jobs being particularly important, lots of jobs in health uh, and education. Uh, and today, agriculture nationally employs less than 5% of the total workforce job. Of course, it still matters to the economy and that can, there's huge regional variation. Uh, but, but I think that's important to know. Another point that Benga just got kind of hinted at is the number, we always hear about rural depopulation. And yes, uh, there is depopulation in rural places, but the number, the real number of people who have been living in uh, rural America has actually increased over the course of time. So our, the, the, the portion of our nation that is living in an urban area is, is great. More people live in an urban area today uh, by share, but by number, by raw number, that number is actually continued to increase. Also uh, important to note that, again, we hear about rural depopulation and it's true, lots of places are depopulating, but immigration in particular, refugees and immigrants have really been driving population growth uh, in lots of places and people of color comprise 83% of rural population growth between 2000 and 2010. Doesn't mean the population got much, much bigger, but those who are moving to rural areas are largely immigrants, refugees and people of color. And finally, uh, I think it's important to note uh, that the rural poverty rate is like consistently higher for both uh, all, all, all people and also for children uh, in rural areas than urban areas. So just a few myths to debunk. But another one I just wanna go with here for a minute is that there are so many different kinds of rural. So you previously saw a map that showed how rural is really very much relative. But I think it's so important that we remember that even if we've seen one rural place, we've really only seen one rural place. I like to hold in mind different rural places to help me get out of my own, I'm from Colorado, 
currently in Nebraska. I've spent a lot of time in the middle of the country, uh, but it is so helpful for me to remember that northern, you know, northern New Mexico and Alaska and Iowa and South Carolina and Maine all have radically different histories and cultural contexts. They have different demographics and their economies are just decidedly different, different cultures. And so we can't just talk about rural America. We have to talk about rural communities and rural cultures and rural people and our policy, therefore, and our investments have to be uh, similarly tailored and curated and thoughtful about regional variation uh, and the just different realities and experiences uh, that, that rural entails in different parts of the country. Next slide, please. So I already made this point. I'm not gonna, I won't belabor all of these since, <laughs> but, but a map that helps you see the places, uh, if you'll go back for a second, uh, uh, see the places that are growing and some of the places that are shrinking. So it's varied. And again, just like Benga said, there's rural in every state. And in every state, there are some places that are rural that are growing and some places that are rural that are shifting. Also important to remember that uh, many places, if they get bigger, then they become urban. And so many of the places that we might have thought of as rural, uh, you know, 50 years ago or even 10 years ago aren't today. So this uh, continues to go feed into the way that our understanding of rural can be kind of murky sometimes and is held in relation to, to urban. Next slide. Um, also just important, this to me, you hear a myth, right? That rural is a place that's just a backwater. It's not the place where there's necessarily innovation. Well, there is, it just might look different. And I think you're gonna see this increasingly becomes a theme as we keep going and as Anita starts to speak. Uh, there's all kinds of innovation happening in rural regions. Uh, and it just isn't necessarily about increasing productivity in the traditional ways. People in rural places are often so resourceful and figuring out how to make make things work with what they have. Uh, and many of our traditional measures uh, just don't do right by uh, the types of innovation that you, see in, that you see in rural regions. I do wanna make just a couple other points I don't think I have a slide for that I could have, I could have mentioned on the previous slide that in, uh, you know, I think it's useful to think about uh, you know, where's a place where rural is really growing and like wh what does success look like? Well, I think it's useful to remember that right now you have a whole lot of you know, one in the midst of COVID, people are rethinking rural, right? And there you see a, a lot of people thinking about, well, maybe cities aren't really the thing. Maybe having big open spaces would be great and I can work remotely. You've seen real growth in recreation um, and um, Recreation and retirement destination economies that would be an example of rural economies right now that are often doing really, that are doing quite well. Um, Pacific Northwest and the Upper Great Lakes, uh, some of the Intermountain West are, two, are three examples of places where that's happening. And would also just mention on the economy front, uh, I mentioned that agriculture is certainly not the backbone for most rural economies. So what is, I bet you could each put in the chat ideas about what's the backbone of a rural economy where you are, but, you got to be creative, right? So we know not so it's it's not just agriculture, it's not just services. We certainly have tourism and recreation, but you also have folks who are really rebuilding economies in different ways. So in North Carolina, for example, there's work to rebuild the textile and industry in a region that was really damaged by uh, the changes in international trade. And so this is where you see incredible, incredible innovation coming through that we might not be able to usually see, right? We've got a cooperative ownership model of a textile value chain in a region where people have a specific skill set and trade uh, that is not necessarily one that exists in other parts of the in other parts of the country. It's part of that region's cultural heritage. It's part of their uh, regional identity and something that can really be built upon. And so if we can think about in that way about different regions, uh, that gives us a new way uh, and an important uh, perspective for thinking about uh, what people need and how, how to invest and support uh, the folks in a rural region to, to make sure that they are true to themselves and also able to build opportunity uh, and, and an economy that really supports the people who are there. Um, this is Anita, and I wonder if I might just jump in. Go ahead. Um, notwithstanding the fact that I am in North Carolina and do <laughs> most of my work in North Carolina, I want to build on this point you're making about manufacturing 
because the loss of the manufacturing industry sector to offshoring really shuttered lots of places um, in rural communities. And it has been amazing to see since 2007, the resurgent of manufacturing, not in terms necessarily of lots of jobs, because to the extent that there's more automation, um, there's more um, efficiency in production. But you think of a place like LaGrange, Georgia, that has grown its manufacturing um, sector focusing primarily on carpet fabrication um, by 75% since 2007. And you can see that dotted all across rural America. And it is clear that um, reshoring and new technological capabilities are making it possible to manufacture in these communities again in a way that competes globally in a very um, good, strong way. So just, just offering some bright spot um, to, to, to put some emphasis on, on the point that you just made. Thanks, Anita. Will you go to the next slide, please, Paul? This will tell us whether it's handoff time or not. Close. Um, so just a couple other slides to just, again, keep you thinking nationally. Um, many of you work locally or regionally, some of you more uh, nationally, but there's certainly, again, great variation from place to place. I mentioned earlier, poverty rate, persistent poverty is certainly uh, an issue in many re in rural counties. Uh, and really, uh, I, the, the vast majority of persistent poverty uh, counties in the United States uh, are places are rural. And as you can see from this map, you see a direct overlay with populations of color and persistent poverty counties and rurality. And that leads us into a really interesting place uh, when we think about policy, when we think about the work that needs to be done, we have to be thinking about this overlay of geographic, uh, economic, and racial inequity that all comes to bear in the same place uh, in many of the places that are, uh, that are here on this map uh, and beyond as well, but, but certainly on this map. Next slide. Uh, and this second map I wanted to just share briefly because I think it's a really interesting resource and it reinforces the point that I just made. Uh, but the University of Michigan um, at the Poverty Solutions Lab has done a lot of work looking at outcomes uh, and created an index of deep disadvantage. And again, what I see, what the researchers who were really Kathy Eden and, Mike, and Luke Schaefer who wrote the book A Dollar a Day uh, back in 2015, I believe it was, or 2016. They are urban focused researchers and they did this work and they are now totally interested and engrossed in the challenges that rural communities face because what they saw, again, was this overlay of inequity that is really uh, structural in nature, particularly in places where you have uh, deep histories of systemic racism uh, and also economic uh, economic disadvantage. Next slide, please. So final point that I want to make, and then I'll just hand it over to Anita, is just to put a few statistics in front of you that really helps you see the diversity uh, that is in rural America. It's easy to think about rural America as white. And of course, that's very true in certain places. And, and rural America is on the whole older and whiter than the nation. Uh, but as you can see, 365, sorry, 356 uh, counties are min minority majority youth counties and another are close. And people of color, as I already mentioned, are really driving population growth in rural regions. Uh, and certainly 50, so 54 of percent of the nation's 37 million American Indian and Alaska Native population uh, live in rural or small town areas. And I personally think we can't be, we, there's no way we can be talking about rural America without also thinking about tribal nations and Indian country that is often adjacent and intermixed and the economies are certainly intertwined as well. Um, next slide, please. And this also just one more map to give you a sense of where you see new immigrant de de uh, destinations in the, in the most recent 20, 30 years. 
uh, and also, in, of course, because of that, really significant demographic change. Uh, and that demographic change, as you can see, it is very centered in the Midwest around, the, uh, you just see the regions, not so much in the far Intermountain West, but the rest of the country we just have very significant demographic shift, which, create, which I will certainly lead you into conversation about education. Uh, and I can't imagine that's something that doesn't come up as you start to delve into uh, rural education uh, work over the course of the next uh, several months together. So I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anita. And of course, thing I jump in here as you go too, because um, we want to make sure that we're having a dialogue with all of you. So appreciate the comments you're putting in the chat. Help us know what's interesting to you. Um, and we asked Anita to help speak some about her own experience and tell us more about what's different work about working in rural regions. Uh, so tell us, Anita. Sure, Catherine. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to jump into the middle of your presentation. I hope you'll plan to do the same for mine. As I said before, I have been working in rural communities um, for almost 30 years in North Carolina. And I also have the great privilege of sitting on the boards of a number of foundations in the state. And so what I hope to bring to you is sort of that dual perspective on what it means to be doing work in rural. Next slide, please. I've divided my presentation into five things that I think matter that really make the difference um, in doing effective work in rural. And the first one is interaction. So even in our world of touch by technology, it's my experience that my work in rural communities always requires more personal interactions. I'll give you just one example around building trust. I am currently doing a project on helping rural communities to increase the uptake of the earned income tax credit. This afternoon, our statewide steering committee, which is made up of residents of the counties in which we're working, will meet for the first time. We typically would have done this in person. They were very clear to us when we recruited them earlier this year, pre-COVID, that that was the preference. Um, at 2.30 when I leave you, I'm going to be talking to them all via Zoom. But it has taken several conversations with each person by telephone and by Zoom to try to sort of build the trust that's critical for them to come together in a group of people they don't know um, and feel like they can completely lean into the conversation. Um, and that's been my experience in rural communities that people are not going to partner with you if they don't trust you and they're not gonna trust you unless they get to know you. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit about capacity and this has been raised by other speakers already. This is always a question in rural communities is, will they have the capacity to do this work? And my one bit of advice here is when going into the work, it's really important not to assume choice, power, ability, or resources, either that folks don't have them or that they do. Um, as Catherine has said, rural communities are as diverse as all communities are. When you've seen one, you've kind of seen one. And so it's really important to go into a community and ask the right questions about capacity, recognizing that the capacity that you've seen somewhere else may not be the way it shows up in this new community, but it doesn't mean that people aren't prepared to lean in, mobilize what capacity they have, and sort of big borrow barter where they, they need additional support. Next slide, please. It's also really important to respect um, the importance of context. Um, as a person who comes from a university 
um, it's not unusual for me to see colleagues walking into communities and presuming that they have the knowledge required. Um, but the real expertise around context has to come from the community itself. And I'll share with you one quick story about a strategic visioning process that I did for, for um, very um, economically disadvantaged um, communities in rural communities in, in North Carolina. Um, I, I do a lot of visioning projects and I start all of them sort of the same way. I want you to take 20 minutes to think a little bit about where your community was 20 years ago, where it is today and where you think it will be in 20 years. And I had barely gotten the prompt out of my mouth when an older woman stood up in the back of the room and I knew when she started um, to address me by baby that it was going to be a dress down and it was indeed. She said, I don't need no 20 minutes to tell you where we were and where we are and where we're going to be because we're at the exact same place and nothing is going to change. Now, you know, I could have argued with her that the data didn't support her point of view on context. But actually, my data was irrelevant at that moment. And that's part of the challenge and part of the opportunity in working in these communities. It's also why it's so important to not assume that just because you found models that worked in other settings that they'll work in every rural community. Um, to the extent that people don't identify with the context that creates the possibility of success on that model, you're just really wasting your time. Next slide, please. And then I wanna just talk a little bit about cultural competence, which in some ways is related to context, but it deserves some attention of its own. Um, again, it's so important not to do anything that creates a perception that your expertise is greater than the community's expertise. When I go into communities, I tell them there are things that I know um, and there are things that you know. And what we're trying to do is put those two things together to create something really special. Um, it means that at any given moment, you've got to be very careful about not devaluing input from community members. They're the experts about their own attributes. This is sort of interesting to me um, as a difference between urban and rural places because I find when I'm doing work in urban places, there's much more of a transactional um, process going on where you're going to give me this, you're going to bring these grant funds to me, I'm going to sit and take your survey, I'm going to, and that's not going back to my point about interactions in rural, that's not the way it is. And so anything that you do that tends to devalue people makes them want to walk away from the table because you've broken the trust. And then I would say finally, do not walk into these communities with a set plan without the expectation to adapt. You may have a vision, but your details are going to change as you listen to the community and as the community makes clear to you what it is they want to come out of the project. And I've been really lucky to work with funders who have been very flexible and understand that this is an adaptive process. Um, and ultimately, what the community says is the priority is really where our ears should be focused and that has to be the center of gravity for the work going forward. Next slide, please. My final slide is about metrics. Um, I love counting things. I count every single thing in the NC Impact Initiative. It drives my colleagues crazy. But it is clear 
in doing this work that you will need to rethink your obsession with metrics, especially those that reflect sustainability because it just looks differently in rural communities. Um, as you've already heard, sometimes there's a challenge with just getting the data to begin with. But I think more importantly, this idea that we often have as funders that we're going to fund the proof of concept. And then once that's clear, we're gonna walk away and the community is gonna be able to amass the resources to keep it going. Just doesn't work in all communities, particularly those that are extremely economically disadvantaged. Um, it's also true that we like to count how many people were served. And by definition, this disadvantages places that are less dense. So the work has to be about the places that were served rather than just looking at aggregate numbers of people served. Um, if it's all about the numbers, you're gonna be funded in, in urban communities. And then finally, um, as I've said, this idea that a community will be able to take over from your proof of concept, that's just often a, a fallacy. And so really to go back to my very first point about interactions and trust and relationships, rural communities are looking for people who want to lean in and be in. And sometimes that takes more time and patience than funders are used to offering. But I can tell you as someone who stands in the middle of that relationship, it is some of the most rewarding work there is. Next slide. And so Leslie, I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, facilitate this section on what are the areas in which more research is needed. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, and I saw in the chat, this um, particular question was um, of interest to some of our participants. As a reminder, if you have other questions and want to just um, pop them up in the chat box that we've been using, we'll use those towards the end of the session. Um, Benga, can we start with you? And um, I'd like each of you to respond to this question of what are the areas in which more research is needed? So I think uh, more research is needed. And I like what Anita and both Catherine have talked about is one of the things is even before getting to the issue of research, we have to reframe our thinking about what constitutes a rural community. Because I think a lot of times, as I said, mentioned earlier, is that it changes what we think is necessary for policy, what people need, and what are the actual problems. And so kind of thinking about capacity, thinking about um, cultural competency, those kind of issues. And so when we design programs or design, you know, we, we know like, you know, there's persistent poverty. Well, how do we fix that? Well, we send more money in. Well, what does that mean? Like, we don't even know what that means. And it means different things in urban areas versus rural areas, which is what I love what Anita brought up of like, in the urban areas that transactional, while rural is more about a conversation. And so first thing is we just need to change how we think about rural communities. And again, depending on where you're in rural Vermont, rural California, rural Alabama, it's going to be different. Now, one of the things in terms of more research is while well, we have to be careful about using data to measure metrics, we still need to have data to know what the problem is. And so if we don't have data, then we don't know what the problem is, and then we're solving the wrong problem. And one of the things I would like to focus on is this pandemic is not just about a public health uh, crisis. But it's also a crisis of systemic racism. And Catherine brought that up, that you know, tribal communities, we have uh, immigration. Uh, we look at the South as a high proportion of African-Americans. And one of the things is that we need to have better data. Like right now, we ha we're having an issue with the census. The census is crucial, especially for rural communities and be able to get resources because that's how all the stuff is based off of. So one of the things is just, getting more data, making sure the data um, projects that we do go on census reach these rural communities so we know more about them, be able to talk about them and highlight the issues. So I think in terms of, for me, we just need more data so that the research that we do do already can be more robust and really target rural areas better. Thank you. Um, Catherine, why don't we move to you? Sure. 
So I will associate myself with Bingus comments on the research agenda and the things we need and just build on those. Um, on the point of we need more data and um, absolutely, one thing I think is important to me mention is I think we often see a real push right now. Uh, well, we, we have for some time and we especially are now to make sure we have demographic data uh, in the say in the context of COVID, right? Like, let's make sure we really understand which populations are being affected and we're seeing and people have been able because of that, that data to be able to see racial disparities really come through and that's been able to prompt a whole nother conversation. What still really doesn't happen very often is actually also having geographic data or we get geographic data, but we don't have race and geographic data plus income data, right? Being able to actually put these things side by side in rural regions in particular, it's always interesting, but the geographic piece is really interesting and important. If you know geography, but you don't know income or race, like you just don't have enough information because we know all of these parts and pieces are at play. So something I think really anybody can do, and I certainly spend lots of time doing this, is when I see organizations or initiatives and efforts that are being thoughtful about understanding diversity and looking deeply, at demographic makeup of efforts, I try to push those folks. Is there a way that you can include some, some measure or marker of ge geography so we can really look at cross tabs on these things and understand what's going on? So that just would add on to the data side of things. More on the policy side of things, um, I don't know if this goes, I think this goes into research. We need more policy development research. We need to understand what does it take uh, for community? Like, what are the things that get in the way of communities being able to uh, become healthy places where people can really live with dignity and thrive? Like, what, what are the barriers? And that can be everything from policy research that helps us understand I, like what are the high impact policies and changes? We might, we think about often say in these specific topics, we think about criminal justice reform. There's a lot of attention on policing. There's a lot of attention to what that might, what changes might happen in big cities in the 400 major metro areas. Well, what are the changes at the much more local level, right? So it might be research that helps people know and see. I think that really a lot of places you still have sheriffs that are elected. Like that's kind of interesting and that's a very different issue than in urban areas. So I can't tell you exactly what the things are to research, but what I can say is that there is systematically not research on what's going on on the places that are beyond the 400 largest metro regions, right? So you just see one report after another that runs data and tells you what's going on 400 major metro regions and larger. And then we say, well, what in the world is going on in these other places? So that's an entire research agenda just to do the same thing that's happening for big places, but uh, for small places too. And then I think there's another just bit of work to just like spend time with communities and really understand what they say their needs are and what problems they're addressing. And then to go back and do the research and policy development work that is responsive to what communities are articulating. Um, and we're doing some of that work right now at the Aspen Community Strategies Group, really listening deeply with communities to understand what they, what does it take and really have a theory of change uh, at the community level that can then start to help us build and inform a more specific research agenda over the course of time. Thank you, Catherine. I mean, I think this is all just hitting home and I think it's so important and we can get to this a little bit in the Q&A. We have been seeing some questions come through, but you know, as, especially funders who are um, considering entering this area, really thinking about making sure that they fully understand the context and what research is available and isn't available um, as they enter this space. And so, Anita, can I ask you to, um, provide your perspective on this question as well? Sure, I'd be happy to do it. Um, and Leslie, to your point, there's the, what research is available, what isn't available, but then what are the limitations of the research that are available? So as I think, for example, pre-COVID-19, we had lots of good research in North Carolina about internet access, broadband access at the county level but once we had to switch to remote learning 
it was clear that there were whole swaths of counties where we were checking the box saying, yes, they have broadband, where students were not going to be able to access broadband. The same was true around childcare. Um, we had identified places that we considered to be childcare deserts, but at an aggregate level that made it harder to see where the real vulnerabilities were going to be um, in a situation such as a pandemic. Now, you know, in all fairness, none of us could have really would have ever thought um, that we would find ourselves in a place like this. But what it has um, made clear, what it has magnified is I think to the point Catherine was making, we have got to drill a little deeper in our data to be sure that we are capturing the pain points of people um, in smaller areas than county or yeah, subdivisions of the county. So I would, would just sort of point that out to funders because I think um, the last six months have just really um, exaggerated in a good way our understanding of people and places that are being left behind. And then the other thing that I would say is more process oriented. It's been my experience that um, all communities, actually both urban and rural, really like research that's around promising practices. Give us some, some ideas of what's happening. But it isn't enough to just give the what. It's really important for that research to talk about the how, and in particular to make clear the challenges that communities can expect to encounter if they follow up on these kinds of strategies. And there is more of that happening in the country these days. But when I think about, for example, something like What Works Cities, which I just think is fabulous, um, because there's so much peer learning happening across these cities as they're struggling through these new innovations. I think to myself, gee, wouldn't it be really nice to have a What Works rural area where you have the same sort of peer learning happening um, across communities? Great. Thank I want to add something. Um, in the chat, uh, posted a report that we did recently on the impact of COVID in rural areas. And this goes back to Catherine's point about we always know about the 400 major metropolitan. And like during this pandemic, it was all about New York City and the tri-state areas. And then it was about Chicago, New Orleans, you know, LA. And then as that got down, people were saying, well, we you were talking about how it got better. But yeah. if you actually drill down in the data and look at rural communities, then there are rural communities that were struggling. But then the problem is we have this kind of misconception of rural areas are these farms and these wide open spaces with small population density where the virus won't spread. And so there were parts of, and that's why the point of like, if you've seen one rural place, you've seen one rural place. So some of those places like farmland areas didn't, and still to this day don't have huge outbreaks, but you look at tribal communities, you look at African-American South, the black belt, they have had the highest and continue to have the highest outbreak. And so without having that data, without breaking it down to those different parts, we are missing a big part of the story of the pandemic. And so just want to highlight that. Thank you. And that actually, oh, Catherine, did you have a comment there? Well, uh, it's actually quite related. So um, I would just say, I, I think there have been a couple of comments also in the chat about um, kind of questioning research being done to people doing, doing research broadly versus people doing research kind of close to home. And I think I, I want to just, so I put an I put a link to a report that we wrote re relatively recently at the community strategies group into the chat box that I think touches on some many of the points that Anita made that Vang has made that I've made um, about uh, kind of working in rural regions even about impact and data and scale um, and it also really does make a point too that again as Anita said rural communities are experts in their own in their own work and their own lived experience and so thinking about when we're talking about research and a research agenda thinking about how a research agenda, people uh, as re people are part of their own research agenda. How do communities and regions and states create, re create their own research agendas uh, and be part of filling those in and doing the work uh, so that research isn't just being done to or about places and people, uh, but, but actually 
that it's participatory, it's engaged, it's really driven by the people who need the answer, who have the questions in it and need answers to do the work. We certainly think about that. There's absolutely a role for a lot of bigger, big data analytical work, take your pick, um, but there's a huge role for communities and then a need for communities to be involved. And there's a place and a really big opportunity to help build capacity to do that at the local level. Uh, and that's one way of thinking about sustainability, right? How do you how are you bringing and helping train a new set of folks or folks with a skill set that they might not have? So just would add that. Thank you, Catherine. And we're getting a lot of really thoughtful questions. Um, in the chat we'll get to as many of them as we can um one thing you know uh anita i have to admit it was um when you talked about you know rethink our obsession with metrics and sustainability that was a little bit hard to hear <laughs> um and you know i think in a lot of ways you know you you really hit the nail on the head there and so one of the questions came in um can you talk more about, you know, building on what y'all have been talking about, the sustainability question? You know, one of the things, even from Greater Texas Foundation, when we're, you know, starting conversations with a community um, or an organization, you know, a lot of times we start with what is our exit plan? You know, thinking about how can we leave in a few years, whenever that is down the road, and not leave you in a vulnerable position. Um, and so, and I know it's something that many, many funders think about a lot. And so if you could just uh, maybe give us some guidance on if you have ideas for how we should be thinking about that or what questions we should be asking instead. So it, it has been my experience in communities where there isn't local philanthropy that the real opportunities for sustaining programs lie in um, the various institutions of local government. And often those institutions aren't at the table in developing these processes. Um, and so the first thing I would say is, you go into a community, you look around, you say, if this is gonna happen, um, after our two-year grant is over, who is going to own it? Um, and, to, and do they have the kind of um, technical um, expertise that they will need in order to own it? And how can we, during the time of this program, build a business model that allows them to either not do something that they otherwise would do because they've decided this is more important or develop some sort of fee generating um, model so that they can have some money to support this, this, this project. So, you know, usually when in the foundations that I'm actively involved in, when we say sustainability, it's like, oh, somebody else is gonna pick it up and maybe the local community foundation will pick it up or maybe you know, this group of philanthropists will pick it up or, or maybe the local government will pick it up with the excess cash that they have. But in the communities I'm talking about, local government doesn't have any excess cash and those other sources of funding, few and far between. And so that means partnering at the front end of the program really think about a business model that makes sense for these communities is much more important than might be than it might be for lots of other funding um, that you might do. Thank you. Catherine or Banga, did either of you, I want to ask if either of you would also like to address that question. And I have I have one more I want to be sure I get at from this set of questions that's been posted here, but also invite you to kind of monitor. And if there's a question that you have a specific answer to, um, I would invite you to answer those as well. But anything you'd like to add to this last one? Okay, um, one of the questions that came in, I thought was, was really interesting. Um, it says, I'm wondering what new or growing challenges folks are anticipating for rural communities in the next five years, particularly impacts from the pandemic and economic downturn and, downturn and where research could help. So, you know, from your work kind of anticipating 
um, what could be coming, I think is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'll start, but others jump in. Um, so, I mean, at first, just the, the, between the pandemic and the recession, state and local budgets are just devastated. Uh, and so, I mean, you just see multi-million dollar budget cuts. And I think what, what the pain of that isn't necessarily going to be felt in this school year or in this calendar year uh, because of how budgets work, right? That folks are planning a little ahead. They may be able to skimp and save. But, uh, you know, when tax revenues are considerably lower for multiple years in a row, uh, when budgets have their, there's no more savings if there were, it wasn't any in the first place. Um, I mean, I think that's going to be certainly for folks at the local level, figuring out how to even make sure that basic services continue uh, is going to be a real uh, challenge in the near term. And it, I think with ripple effects uh, that you'll see for, for years to come. Um, I think we do see, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, but I think there's a huge opportunity. There's a moment right now where we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but is there a chance that there's actually more faith in government and an opportunity for institutions to actually show that it really matters uh, that whether you can provide services and you can be responsive in a public health emergency, what we're mostly seeing is less faith in institutions and government. Uh, and if that fades even further than it is, uh, I think it, particularly rural areas and rural regions where you already have a, an infrastructure, an institutional infrastructure that is in decline, I think that you could see uh, some considerable kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't know where we go from here. I mean, what, like, where does responsibility lie? How does work get done? Uh, how do communities rebuild systems? I think it's also possible that communities are in crisis and that when crisis comes around, there will be some places with creative people or determined people who come together and come up with some things that are just plain different. And so we might see some real opportunities and some real um, changes uh, that are not just around the edges, not just making it, but like, let's just blow this up and start over. I think you could see some of that not necessarily out of uh, for any reason other than than dealing with real crisis, uh, and th and that would probably in some places include. I think about food systems that may may need to change radically, or school systems may need to change radically. Communities that say and really take on the work of addressing systemic racism or policing in a very different kind of way. Uh, we might see the emergence of very new and different things if those are properly cultivated and supported. Just a few ideas. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's lots more. I'll just add one because I know we're trying to um, get to as many questions as we can. Um, but the thing that keeps me up at night is I think that we're going to lose a lot of students um, yeah. this year. Um, and, you know, whether they're opportunity youth or disconnected youth um, in talking to school superintendents in both urban and rural areas, many are willing to concede that they have, you know, up to 20, somebody said 25% of their students who just have not reconnected um, to remote learning. And in North Carolina, we're all remote learning at this point. Um, and I worry a lot about that particularly in places where there aren't the number of nonprofit organizations that you might have in a more dense area that might take on the responsibility for creating some sort of system of support for those young people. Um, if, if the national um, predictions of um, disconnected youth numbers surging to 30% um, hold anywhere near to true. It's not just a challenge for the next five years, it's a challenge for the next 50. Thank you. I just want to piggyback on that point. The biggest thing that worries me is expanded inequality. And one thing I focus on is that it's not like we don't know what a recovery that doesn't include everybody looks like. You look at the Great Recession, which was just 12 years ago, big cities, metro areas all recovered, rural areas did not recover. 
you know, some areas did all right, but a lot of areas didn't do, do well. And I'm really worried that in this pandemic, it's going to be the same thing, especially given that it's a public health crisis. So you look at the issue of broadband access, you know, the kids who don't have, you know, access to remote, you know, places that have to equip school buses with Wi-Fi so that kids can go to school, it's going to exacerbate that inequality. And that's what is my biggest worry. Thank you all. That Those were, I thought that was a very thoughtful question and uh, appreciated your responses. And I think, you know, it gives us some maybe ideas for some topic areas to tackle next. We have, um, we have about three minutes left before Paul's going to close us out. So I'm going to just go down my screen here and ask each of you if you have 30 to 60 seconds of closing thoughts and or if there's one of these targeted questions that have come through on the Q&A that you can address really quickly. Um, and then would also just, and these are awesome questions, I wish we had another hour, um, invite people to make sure to review the bios, get contact information and all of that so um, everyone can continue to be a resource. But um, Catherine, can we start with you? Sure, so I think this will touch on a couple questions, but maybe just a parting shot to something to think about. Um, you know, so what can philanthropy do? You know, how can you be helpful and how can you be powerful, whether it comes to when it comes to broadband or other things? What I would really challenge you to do and think about is, you know, how philanthropy is uniquely positioned to be the first risk taker in the system. There are lots of things that are, these are huge problems we're talking about. And they need, a lot of them are going to require significant investment, often from state or federal government, maybe sometimes local and other private, private sector investment. But how do you help to create the model? How do you help to de-risk the solutions? How do you provide the 10% the of match that enables a community to actually access those state or federal resources or the technical assistance? The thing that the taxpayers don't want to pay for, right? The thing that, that that the public won't tolerate uh, in out of the public sector, right? Failure. You have the flexibility, the opportunity, and therefore the responsibility to take risks and try new things and help test models so that they can be things that the public is willing to invest in. Uh, at least in my opinion, that is a place where you're uniquely positioned to help ensure that uh, we don't continue to make the same mistakes, but we try new things, we make new mistakes, we innovate, and we actually uh, make change and progress over time. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Anita, 30 seconds. Um, I'm gonna answer Paul's question, which is, um, given what I've said, do I think funders um, who are in rural areas need to be looking at a five to 15 year engagement versus one to two? Yes. Thank you. Benga? And then I'll just end with this is uh, focus locally and, you know, rely on each community, rely on the people in the community to help guide your work so that you don't come in and do like the helicopter where you come in, you know, with your cape and save the day and then leave, but more of like, how do we work with that local community and then that way to foster sustainability. I think that's a perfect note um, to close us out on. Thank you all so much. This was fantastic. I'm going to pass it back over to Paul, um, who's going to close us out. All righty. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank the speakers for their time today and their expertise. I want to thank all of you in the audience for your robust questions. Um, we want to make sure that we continue this conversation over the long term. We don't want this to be a one shot program that we offer. So we're actually going to post a link to a quick survey in the chat. We'd like for all of you to fill that out. Um, we're going to ask you, you know, what more about rural education are you interested in learning about? Um, and we're going to take those questions and comments back to, uh, we have an informal rural education working group, and we're going to discuss and highlight the questions um, that will help inform our future programming. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that group, please feel free to email me at pmoon at edfunders.org. Um, and I'd also like to give a quick thank you to the Aspen Institute and Catherine for helping to put all of this together. 
Um, lastly, a real quick plug, we have a lot of great programming coming up. Uh, if you don't know already, we have conference year round sessions occurring uh, every month until April of 2021. We have eight, uh, we have eight sessions uh, that occurred during the first week of every month. Um, and so the next round will be on October the 5th through the 8th. And then we have our conference week um, from October 12th to the 16th. So um, we encourage you to register if you haven't already. If you have any questions, I'm always available. Um, this webinar uh, will be available in a recorded form in the uh, upcoming weeks. And so if you would like to also subscribe to our updates, the link is here below. Um, so thank you all again for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you all during our next program. Thank you.